The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime, Chapter 37. I do not tell lies. Mother used to say that this was because I was a good person, but it is not because I am a good person. It is because I can't tell lies. Mother was a small person who smelled nice, and she sometimes wore a fleece with a zip down the front, which was pink, and it had a tiny label which said Birdhouse on the left bosom. Lie is when you say something happened which didn't happen. But there is only ever one thing which happened at a particular time, in a particular place, and there are an infinite number of things which didn't happen at that time, in that place. And if I think about something which didn't happen, I start thinking about all the other things which didn't happen. For example, this morning for breakfast I had ready break and some hot raspberry milkshake, but if I say that I actually had shreddies in a mug of tea, I start thinking about Cocoa Pops and lemonade and porridge and Dr. Pepper, and how I wasn't eating my breakfast in Egypt, and there wasn't a rhinoceros in the room, and father wasn't wearing a diving suit, and so on, and even writing this makes me feel shaky and scared, like I do when I'm standing on the top of a very tall building, and there are thousands of houses and cars and people below me, and my head is so full of all these things that I'm afraid that I'm going to forget to stand up straight and hang on to the rail, and I'm going to fall over and be killed. This is another reason why I don't like proper novels, because they're lies about things which didn't happen, and they make me feel shaky and scared. And this is why everything I have written here is true. Chapter 41. There were clouds in the sky on the way home, so I couldn't see the Milky Way. I said, I'm sorry, because Father had had to come to the police station, which was a bad thing. He said, it's okay. I said, I didn't kill the dog, and he said, I know. Then he said, Christopher, you have to stay out of trouble, okay? I said, I didn't know I was going to get into trouble. I like Wellington, and I went to say hello to him, but I didn't know that someone had killed him. Father said, just try and keep your nose out of other people's business. I thought for a little, and I said, I'm going to find out who killed Wellington. And Father said, were you listening to what I was saying, Christopher? I said, yes, I was listening to what you were saying. When someone gets murdered, you have to find out who did it so that they can be punished. And he said, it's a bloody dog, Christopher, a bloody dog. I replied, I think dogs are important too. He said, leave it. And I said, I wonder if the police will find out who killed him and punish the person. Then Father banged the steering wheel with his fist, and the car weaved a little bit across the dotted line in the middle of the road, and he shouted, I said, leave it, for God's sake. I could tell that he was angry because he was shouting, and I didn't want to make him angry, so I didn't say anything else until we got home. When we came in through the front door, I went into the kitchen and got a carrot for Toby, and I went upstairs, and I shut the door of my room, and I let Toby out and gave him the carrot. Then I turned my computer on and played 76 games of Minesweeper and did the expert version of 102 seconds, which was only 3 seconds off my best time, which was 99 seconds. At 2.07 a.m. I decided that I wanted to drink, uh, excuse me, at 2.07 a.m. I decided that I wanted a drink of orange squash before I brushed my teeth and got into bed. So I went downstairs to the kitchen. Father was sitting on the sofa watching Snooker on the television and drinking scotch. There were tears coming out of his eyes. I asked, are you sad about Wellington? He looked at me for a long time and sucked air in through his nose. Then he said, yes, Christopher, you could say that. You could very well say that. I decided to leave him alone because when I am sad, I want to be left alone. So I didn't say anything else. I just went into the kitchen and made my own squash and took it back upstairs to my room. Chapter 43. <clears throat> Mother died two years ago. I came home from school one day and no one answered the door, so I went and found the secret key that we keep under a flower pot behind the kitchen door. I let myself into the house and carried on making the Airfix Sherman tank model I was building. An hour and a half later, Father came home from work. He runs a business and he does heating maintenance and boiler repair with a man called Rodri, who is his employee. He knocked on the door of my room and opened it and asked whether I had seen Mother. I said I, that I hadn't seen her and he went downstairs and started making some phone calls. I did not hear what he said. And he came up to my room and said he had to go out for a while and wasn't sure how long he would be. He said that if I needed anything, I should call him on his mobile phone. He, ran, he was away for two and a half hours. When he came back, I went downstairs. He was sitting in the kitchen, staring out of the back window down the garden to the pond and the corrugated iron fence on the top of the tower church on Manstead Street, which looks like a castle because it is Norman. Father said, I'm afraid you won't be seeing your mother for a while. He didn't look at me when he said this. He kept on looking through the window. Usually people look at you when they're talking to you. I know that they're working out what I'm thinking, but I can't tell what they're thinking. It's like being in a room with a one-way mirror in a spy film. But this was nice, having Father speak to me, but not look at me. I said, why not? He waited for a very long time. Then he said, your mother has had to go into hospital. Can we visit her, I asked, because I like hospitals. 
I like the uniforms and the machines. The father said, no. I said, why can't we? He said, she needs rest. She needs to be on her own. I asked, is it a psychiatric hospital? The father said, no, it's an ordinary hospital. She has a problem, a problem with her heart. I said, we'll need to take food to her because I know that, knew that food in hospital was not very good. Dave from school, he went into the hospital to have an operation on his leg to make his calf muscle longer so that he could walk better, and he hated the food, so his mother used to take meals in every day. Father waited for a long time again and said, I'll take some into her during the day when you're at school, and I'll give it to the doctors, and they can give it to your mom, okay? I said, but you can't cook. Father put his hands over his face and said, Christopher, look, I'll buy some ready-made stuff from Marks and Spencer's, and I'll and take those in. She likes those. I said I would make her a get well card because that is what you do for people when they're in hospital. Father said he would take it in the next day. Chapter 47. In the bus on the way to school, next morning we passed four red cars in a row, which meant that it was a good day. So I decided not to be sad about Wellington. Mr. Jeevens, the, school, the psychologist at the school, once asked me why four red cars in a row made it a good day and three red cars in a row made it a quite good day and five red cars in a row made it a super good day and why four yellow cars in a row made it a black day, which is a day when I don't speak to anyone and sit on my own reading books and don't eat my lunch and take no risks. He said that I was clearly a very logical person, so he was surprised that I should think like this because it wasn't very logical. I said that I like things to be in a nice order, and one way of things being in a nice order was to be logical especially if those things were numbers or an argument, but there were other ways of putting things in a nice order, and that was why I had good days and black days. I said that some people who worked in an office came out of their house in the morning and saw that the sun was shining and it made them feel happy, or they saw that it was raining and it made them feel sad, but the only difference was the weather. If they worked in an office, the weather didn't have anything to do with whether they had a good day or a bad day. I said that when Father got up in the morning, he always put his trousers on before he put his socks on, and it wasn't logical, but he always did it that way because he liked things in a nice order too. Also, whenever he went upstairs, he went up two at a time, always starting with his right foot. Mr. Jeevens said that I was a very clever boy. I said that I wasn't clever. I was just noticing how things were, and that wasn't clever. That was just being observant. Being clever was when you looked at how things were used, were and used the evidence to work out something new, like the universe expanding, or who committed a murder, or if you see someone's name, you give each letter a value from 1 to 26, A equals 1, B equals 2, etc., and you add the numbers up in your head, and you find that it makes a prime number, like Jesus Christ, 131, or Scooby-Doo, 113, or Sherlock Holmes, 163, or Dr. Watson, 167. Mr. Jeevens asked me whether this made me feel safe, having things always in a nice order, and I said it did. Then he asked if I didn't like things changing, and I said I wouldn't mind things changing if I became an astronaut, for example. It was one of the biggest changes you can imagine, apart from becoming a girl or dying. He asked whether I wanted to become an astronaut, and I said I did. He said that it was very difficult to become an astronaut. I said that I knew you had to become an officer in the Air Force. You had to take lots of orders and be prepared to kill other human beings, and I couldn't take orders. Also, I didn't have 20-20 vision, which you needed to be a pilot, but I said that you could still want something that is very unlikely to happen. Terry, who was the older brother of Francis, who was at the school, said I would only ever get a job collecting supermarket trawlers or cleaning out donkey shit at an animal sanctuary, and they didn't let spazzers drive rockets that cost billions of pounds. When I told this to Father, he said that Terry was jealous of my being cleverer than him. It was a stupid thing to think because we weren't in a com competition. But Terry is stupid. It's a quad erat demonstrandum, which is Latin for it, which is the thing that was go going to be proved, which means thus it is proved. I'm not a spaz spazzer, which means spastic, not like Francis, who is a spazzer. And even though I probably won't become an astronaut, I'm going to go to university and study mathematics or physics or physics and mathematics, which is a joint honor school, because I like mathematics and physics and I'm very good at them. But Terry won't go to university. Father says Terry is most likely to end up in prison. Terry has a tattoo on his arm of a heart shape with a knife through the middle of it. But this is what is called a digression, and I'm going to go back to the fact that it was a good day. Because it was a good day, I said that I would try and find out who killed Wellington. It was a good day as a day for planning, for projects and planning things. When I said this to Siobhan, she said, Well, we're meant to be writing stories today, so why don't you write about finding Wellington and going to the police station? And that is when I started writing this. Siobhan said that she would help with the spelling and the grammar and the footnotes. <clears throat> Chapter 53. Mother died two weeks later. I had not been into hospital to see her, but father had taken in lots of food from Marks and Spencer's. He said that she had been looking okay and seemed to be getting better. She had sent me lots of love and had my get well card on the table beside her. Father said that she liked it very much. The car had pictures, excuse me, the card had pictures of cars on the front. It looked like this. I did it at school with Mrs. Peters, who does art, and it was a lino cut. 
which is when you draw a picture on a piece of lino and Mrs. Peters cuts around the picture with a Stanley knife and then you put ink on the lino and press it onto the paper, which is why all the cars look the same. Because he did one car and pressed it onto the paper nine times. It was Mrs. Peters' idea to do lots of cars, which I liked, and I colored all the cars in with red paint to make it a super good day for Mother. Harper, pipe down. Father said that she died of a heart attack and it wasn't expected. I said, what kind of heart attack? Because I was surprised. Mother was only 38 years old and heart attacks usually happen to older people and mother was very active and rode a bicycle and ate food which was healthy and high in fiber and low in saturated fat like chicken and vegetables and muesli. Father said that he didn't know what kind of heart attack she had and now wasn't the moment to be asking questions like that. I said that it was probably an aneurysm. A heart attack is when some of the muscles in the heart stop getting blood and die. There are two main types of heart attack. The first is an embolism. That is when a blood clot blocks one of the blood vessels, taking blood to the muscles in the heart. You can stop this from happening, happening by taking aspirin and eating fish. This is why the Eskimos don't get this sort of heart attack, because they eat fish and fish stop their blood from clotting, but if they cut themselves badly, they can bleed to death. But an aneurysm is when a blood vessel breaks and the blood doesn't get to the heart muscles because it is leaking. And some people get aneurysms just because there's a weak bit in their blood vessels, like Mrs. Hardesty, who lived at number 72 in our street, who had a weak bit in the blood vessels in her neck and died just because she turned her head around to reverse her car into a parking space. On the other hand, it could have been an embolism because your blood clots much more easily when you're lying down for a long time, like when you're in hospital. Father said, I'm sorry, Christopher. I'm really sorry. But it wasn't his fault. Then Mrs. Shears came over and cooked supper for us, and she was wearing sandals and jeans and a t-shirt, which had the words windsurf and corfu and a picture of windsurfer on it. My father was sitting down, and she stood next to him and held his head against her bosoms and said, Come on, Ed. We're going to get you through this. And then she made us spaghetti and tomato sauce. And after dinner, she played Scrabble with me, and I beat her 247 points to 134. Chapter 59. I decided that I was going to find out who killed Wellington, even though Father had told me to stay out of other people's business. This is because I do not always do what I am told. And this is because when people tell you what to do, it is usually confusing and does not make sense. For example, people often say, be quiet, but they don't tell you how long to be quiet for. Or you see a sign which says, keep off the grass, but it should say, keep off the grass around this sign, or keep off all the grass in this park, because there's lots of grass you are allowed to walk on. Also, people break rules all the time. For example, father often drives at over 30 miles per hour in a 30 mile per hour zone, and sometimes he drives when he's been drinking, and often he doesn't wear a seatbelt when he is driving his van. In the Bible, it says, thou shalt not kill, but there were the Crusades and two world wars and the Gulf War, and there were Christians killing people in all of them. Also, I don't know what father means when he says, stay out of other people's business, because I do not know what he means by other people's business, because I do lots of things with other people at school and in the shop and on the bus, and his job is going into other people's houses and fixing their boilers and their heating. And all of these things are other people's business. Shabon understands. When she tells me not to do something, she tells me exactly what it is that I am not allowed to do. And I like this. For example, she once said, you, mu you must never punch Sarah or hit her in any way, Christopher, even if she hits you first. If she does hit you again, move away from her and stand still and count from 1 to 50, then come and tell me what she has done or tell one of the other members of the staff what she has done. Or, for example, she once said, if you want to go on the swings and there are already people on the swings, you must never push them off. You must ask them if you can have a go, and then you must wait until they have finished. When other people tell you what you can't do, they don't do it like this, so I decide for myself what I am going to do and what I am not going to do. That evening, I went round to Mrs. Shear's house and knocked on the door and waited for her to answer it. When she opened the door, she was holding a mug of tea, and she was wearing sheepskin slippers, and she had been watching quiz program on the television because there was a television on, and I could hear someone saying, The capital city of Venezuela is A. Maracas, B. Caracas, C. Bogota, or D. Georgetown. And I knew that it was Caracas. She said, Christopher, I really don't think I want to see you right now. I said, I didn't kill Wellington. She replied, what are you doing here? I said, I wanted to come and tell you that I didn't kill Wellington. But also, I want to find out who killed him. Some of her tea spilled onto the carpet. I said, do you know who killed Wellington? She didn't answer my question. She just said, goodbye, Christopher, and closed the door. Then I decided to do some detective work. I could see that she was watching me and waiting for me to leave because I could see her standing in the hall on the other side of the frosted glass in her front door. So I walked down the path and out of the garden. And I turned around and saw that she wasn't standing in the hall any longer. I made sure that there was no one watching and climbed over the wall and walked down the side of the house into her back garden to the shed where she kept all her gardening tools. The shed was locked with a padlock and I couldn't go inside so I walked around to the window in the side. Then I had some good luck 
and good luck. Excuse me. When I looked through the window, I could see a fork that looked exactly the same as the fork that had been sticking out of Wellington. I was lying on the bench by the window and it had been cleaned because there was no blood on the spikes. I could see some other tools as well, a spade and a rake and one of those long clippers people use for cutting branches which are too high to reach. They all had the same green plastic handles like the fork. This meant that the fork belonged to Mrs. Shears. Either that or it was a red herring, which is a clue that makes you come to a wrong conclusion or something which looks like a clue, but isn't. I wondered if Mrs. Shears had killed Wellington herself. But if she had killed Wellington herself, why did she come out of the house shouting, What in fuck's name have you done to my dog? I thought that Mrs. Shears probably didn't kill Wellington, but whoever had killed him had probably killed him with Mrs. Shears' fork. And the shed was locked. This meant that it was someone who had the key to Mrs. Shears' shed, or that she had left it unlocked, or that she had left her fork lying around in the garden. I heard a noise and turned around and saw Mrs. Shears standing on the lawn looking at me. I said, I came to see if the fork was in the shed. And she said, if you don't go, now, I will call the police again. So I went home. When I got home, I said hello to father and went upstairs and fed Toby my rat and felt happy because I was being a detective and finding things out. <laughs>